The title of the message this morning is Planning Life. Planning Life. And uh, I, I was motivated to bring this message really long before I left on vacation just a few weeks ago because of decisions that people are making. We have people in our church that have major decisions lying before them right now. There are some who are considering career changes. There are some who are dealing with other aspects of their life. There are always young people that are, that are making decisions about uh, a lifelong decision about a husband or a wife or the potential of that. We have uh, people that are young people in particular that are going to school and where are they going to be at? And you've got m- multitudes of other things. And my, here's my concern, and this is in a nutshell what this message is about. When we go through life, as Christians especially, and we are making plans for our life, and we're going to do this and we're going to do that, and we don't even consult God. We're living like atheists when we do that. Atheists don't bow their head in the presence of God and say, Lord, give me direction today. No, they don't even acknowledge him because they don't believe he exists. And my contention in this message is that many of us, myself included, is that oftentimes when things get rough in our life and decisions need to be made in our life and plans need to be made in our life, we're we're making the plans, but we're not consulting God at all. We're living like God doesn't even exist. And God has, listen, if you don't get anything else out of this message, get this. God has a plan for your life. He really does. God just didn't bring you into the world and say, now make it on your own. He has a specific plan for your life. And you can mess that plan up. I believe in the sovereignty of God. I do. But I also believe in the free moral agency of man. He made us with the ability to make choices in our life. And he wants us to make those choices guided by his Holy Spirit for our lives. Because he knows what's best for us. Let's start reading in James chapter 4 beginning in verse 13. Go to, go to now, ye that say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas you don't even know what's going to be on the morrow. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. What is your life? Well, here's what it is. It's a vapor. It appears for a little time and then it's gone. It vanishes away. For that you ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live. And do this or do that. But now you rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. One of the things that has always amazed me about mankind in general and Christians, especially Christians, is that we oftentimes demonstrate in our our own life an insatiable desire to know what's going to happen in the future. Many, many times people have brought things to my attention that they're really asking me, what's going to happen? What should I do? I I don't have insights into the future other than what the Word of God gives to me or specifically what the Holy Spirit gives to me. And as we consider different things in our life, I I have known of times when there are people who are Christians, really, really and truly born again Christians, who are seeking out psychics to tell them about the future. Now please hear this. The Bible forbids that we should do such things as that. It not only says it's wrong, it forbids us to even do things like that. It's satanic. It's not from God at all. I would suppose that uh, even though I don't read a lot of newspapers anymore, I like to signal that's about it. Most major newspapers in the United States of America and around the world, they have a daily horoscope for their readers. I've always been kind of amused at at the ignorance, and I'm saying it that I'm not trying to insult anybody when I say that, but at Christians who oftentimes when they have the opportunity, they'll stop and they'll speak and they'll bring it up in the study or sometime in some other way, and they'll want to know, is there anything wrong with me looking at a psychic? Anything wrong with me looking at a horoscope? Anything wrong with me looking at tarot cards? I guess that's how you would pronounce it, really. Yes, everything is wrong about it. God forbids it. He says children, his children should never, ever, ever be doing things like that. This matter of the future, God really wants Christians to not only be fascinated by what the possibilities are, but to realize that God holds the future in his hands. Did, did you know, just as an evidence of that to you, and you may not be aware of this, I say this all the time to people, particularly on Sunday morning, because oftentimes you've got lost people that are here on Sunday mornings. Do you know that you're not here by accident this morning? That God and his eternal purposes made a decision 
that on this day, September the 7th, 2014, you would be in the house of God, and he put this message on my heart, and I didn't even know it was for you. But he put it on my heart because he loves you and wants you to know he's got a plan for your life. He wants you to turn some things around in your life and let him implement that plan in your life. That always begins with salvation. Many of you know who the name Dwight Pentecost is. Dwight Pentecost wrote one of the great uh, books on the second coming of Christ. And uh, Dwight Pentecost was a longtime faculty member of Dallas Theological Seminary. And he's held by many to be a premier scholar on prophecy. That if you want to go to him, his book that he wrote, which is very thick, that that book entitled Things to Come, uh, I lend that book out um, quite often. And if you have that book, please bring it back to me. I don't mind you borrowing it, but it's been gone a long time. And I do use that book on a regular basis. So if you've got to bring it back, I'm not mad at you or anything like that, just bring it back. And, and he makes a very interesting statement. He says, when he spoke on some subject other than prophecy, the attendance in his meetings would fall in half. If he announced wherever he was speaking at, I'm going to be preaching on prophecy, he might have a thousand people, depending on where he's at and, and the circumstances like that, where he's at, and, and he says, there'll be a thousand people to show up. If I stand up and I announce, or if the pastor stands up and announces that Dwight Pentecost is going to be preaching on any other subject, it's cut in half. Now, you look at that and you say, well, what's wrong with that? Well, let me read you what Dwight Pentecost had to say in his own words. I was struck anew with the fact that almost without exception, when the second coming of Christ is mentioned in the New Testament, it is followed by an exhortation to godliness and holy living. Did you get what he's saying there? When he, he finds in the Bible that when God speaks about things that are going to happen in the future, it's always, always, always followed by holiness. A, a desire for us to have a holy life to, to follow him. Now I'm bringing all of that to your attention because uh, you may want to know the future and we can tell you according to the Bible, we're not, we're not finished with... Uh, a lot of things over there in the Middle East. I've preached on that so many times. Uh, I know some of you get tired of it because I've been on it. But I get on it all of the time because there's so many new developments that are happening all the time. We're looking for Russia to bring her allies against the nation of Israel. That's going to happen. A battle of Haman and God. It's going to happen. And they're going to fight Israel and try and destroy Israel and crush Israel down. And God's, God's going to stop that from happening. And he, he, he prints that out for us in his word and lets us know that. If you want to know about the future, God has chosen to allow us to know certain things are going to happen in the future. But when it comes to your life, he wants you to lean upon him, to depend upon him. The point that James is, make, James is making in what I just shared with you from his word, from the Lord's word, is knowing the future. Listen to this. Knowing the future is not near as important as being pre prepared for the future. Knowing the future is not near as important as being prepared for the future. Let me ask you a question. You want to know about when Jesus is coming back? There's, there's something that's given to us in the Bible that says, here's how you can tell when Jesus is coming back. It could happen at any moment. It can happen at any moment. He could come right. There's not one single prophecy that needs to be fulfilled. And Jesus could come back at any moment. Now let me ask you this question. Are you ready if he comes back right now? Crowds down. We've got about 50-something women that are down in, I guess they're still down in the mountains there in Tennessee. <clears throat> Had to get together for the ladies, and that's a good thing. Glad they're gone. Glad to get to be able to do that. We, we husbands always miss them, and I know the church misses them too, but they'll be back soon. Still got a lot of ladies here. Maybe you all ought to start your own getaway, you know. Some, not, 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 I should have said that, not being with that one at all. We don't want to live like atheists. We don't want to live in such a way that what we're doing is we're living our life like God doesn't even exist. Now, let me bring you back, because this is really strong on my mind right now. Let me bring you back to this decision that you're, you're about to make right now. Come on, stay with me. This decision that you're getting ready to make right now, have you even consulted with God? Have you said anything to God about what he wants to do with this? Listen to what Psalm 14 and verse 1 says. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. They're corrupt and have done abominable works, and there is none that doeth good. When you begin to make plans and even implement those plans with a thousand disregards to God, regardless of what you may say you believe, 
you're living like an atheist. When you begin to make your plans about what you're going to do with your life and you have no regard for God, you're living in a way that's no different than an atheist lives. Now, I don't think any one of us would really want to do that, but the test of what we really believe is not found in what we say, but in how we live. What we really and truly have in our life. And a lot of people today profess that they believe in Christ, but nevertheless, they continue to live their lives just like God doesn't even exist. In fact, there's a tendency to live with the benefits of God's grace. Now, this is for you and I that are born again. I, I know that I've trusted Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. You know that you've trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. But there's a great danger that we face. Salvation is by grace through faith. There's nothing that you can do to earn it. I want to make sure I get this in. There's absolutely not. You can't live a life good enough for God to look at you and say, all right, come on in uh, past these pearly gates and walk on these streets of gold because we're going to allow you to live here with me forever because you've been such a good person on earth. That's not what the Bible teaches at all. The Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that seeks after God. If you're here today, you, you probably are here because somebody invited you. Uh, Jeremy and I were just doing this just in passing this past week, and we began to look at the families that come into our church in the last, I don't know, I'm going to say a year. I really don't know exactly how long it's been. Seven or eight families, something like that. And, and, and I think I'm right about this when I say every single one of them that came to our church came because somebody invited them. As a matter of fact, uh, Donna was telling me before she left on the ladies' retreat, we just came back from Montana. We went out there on vacation to Yellowstone National Park, and we used to live out there, and so we loved going out. Love seeing people that we know, and I've already given a report to the church, so I won't, won't draw all that out. But she comes back to work, and a day or two after she comes back to work, she sits down with some people to come in. They want to open a brand new account. Guess where they were from? Ennis, Montana. Can I tell you that if there's any town I would go to because of the sheer beauty and want to pastor a church there, it would be Ennis, Montana. Now, I'm not doing that. Somebody asked me today, you're going to end up moving out there. No, I won't either. It's a big difference in living somewhere and just visiting somewhere. Just an amazing thing to me. I, I just thought that's really, really a neat thing. God is in control, and God is always doing things that we sometimes don't. But my point is grace. That's what I want to get to, grace. You and I are recipients of grace, and God has put that in our life, and we're very aware of the fact that we owe everything to God, that he did everything upon the cross of Calvary with his son so that you and I could have eternal life just by believing on him. It's that simple. You believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for you personally, that God raised him from the dead, and that he's alive today. If you believe that with all of your heart and give your life to the Lord, you'll walk out of here with eternal life today. That's what we call grace. Now let me tell you the danger that happens to you and I after the grace has come into our life. A period of time goes by, and after a while we're taking grace for granted. Let me explain to you what I mean. Somebody suggested that the steps that we follow in grace as Christians are these. We experience grace, that is, we get saved. We come to a realization that we don't deserve, but God gives it anyhow. And then we become accustomed to grace. Do you realize, as you sit here this morning, that God has bestowed many, many gifts upon you? His grace, he gives good things to his people. That's what grace is about. He gives things that we don't deserve because he loves us. He gives all of that to us, and after a while, we begin to accept it without even thinking that God has given it. Kind of reminds me of some people that I know, and uh, one in particular that's kind of my mind, individual would buy Christmas gifts for people, and around our church you see a lot of that going on, uh, people buying gifts for each other. And after a while, there's been so many years that have passed by where a gift was given that now they want to start describing the gift that they were going to... Hey, listen, if you're going to buy me a Christmas gift this year, here's what I'd like to have. A brand new Toyota Camry or something like that. You know, you, you want to have something like that. And th my point is simply this, we experience grace and then we get accustomed to grace. We become unthankful. That's what, exactly what happens. And after we become accustomed to grace, then we commit the sin of expecting grace. Grace is giving us something we don't deserve. We have no right to expect God's grace, but he gives it to us anyhow. And then the final step in this is that we think we deserve grace. Are, are you there right now? God has bestowed his blessings upon you so abundantly and you fail to realize that you don't, deserve any, you don't deserve any one of them. I'm not elevating myself. I don't deserve any one of them that God gives to me. But he gives it. Now, very closely associated with this is mercy also. But I'm not going to get into that right now. Listen, when people live in total disregard for the wishes of an all-knowing and all-powerful God, they're living like an atheist. They're not living like God wants them to live. Now, here's some of the problems. There's three common mistakes in dealing with the future, dealing with making plans. Here's mistake number one. I've been alluding to it right along. Planning without God. 
What you've got under, under consideration here is that it's not open defiance against God. It's disregard for God. You're not shaking your fist in the face of God. You're just living like he doesn't exist. Do you live like he doesn't exist? How would an atheist live? I doubt very much that you're going to find an atheist anywhere, and there aren't that many atheists. But if you're not going to find an atheist anywhere. When you go out and you go into a restaurant today to eat, you're not going to see an atheist sitting there saying, oh, honey, we forgot to pray. Let's ask blessing over the food. And the atheist is going to bow his head and ask blessing over the food. But you don't do that. You live like an atheist. You, you, you have the children that you've got, and you just raise them up and enjoy the children. You don't think one thing at all about giving back to God who gave you the child. It's living like an atheist. God says, I'm in your life every single day, and I want you to recognize I'm in your life every day, and I want to bless you in your life every day, but you've got to acknowledge me. In fact, it's foolish not to acknowledge him because there's something that happens to us. Listen once again to James chapter 4 and verse 13. Go to now. What he's really saying is, come on now. That's how you and I would say, come on now. This is an obvious truth. Come on, open your mind and, and think about this truth. Go to now ye that say, today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get, get gain. This is an attitude of arrogance, self-sufficiency. You were touching on that in Sunday school this morning. Arrogance. It's not arrogance against a brother. It's arrogance. It's worse. It's an arrogance against God. It's directed to you who say, literally the ones continuing to say. It's in the present tense, and so that signifies that it's a habitual practice that needs to be corrected. And that's the point of this. That's the point of exactly what James is doing. You're living your life routinely. This is not an individual sin you commit every now and then. This is in your life every day, and you live under this pretense that you're in control of the future, and you're not. God is in control of the future. So when we begin to look at our minds and we're making plans, we've got to understand that God's not pleased with that. And, and, and there's a lot of things that are done here. They decided, number one, that they were going to have a precise time, today or tomorrow, a particular place that they were going to carry their plans out in such a city, a predetermined duration of the stay, spend a year there. They plan the activity, buy and sell, and the profit they expect to gain and make a profit. So what's wrong with that? You would talk to the average businessman and he would say to you, so what? So what's wrong with that? Listen to me. The complete picture is one which get the will of God is not even considered. It isn't that they're making plans. Plans weren't the sin. They were planning without God. That's what they were doing. And sometimes that's what we're doing. Our church on, on the budget meeting, there's a lot of things that we go into when the officers meet together, pray for that budget meeting. Offerings are down this year. That always gives great concern to me and to all men, I know it does, to the church in general. shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't happen when something like that is, is going on. But it does happen uh, from time to time. So you need to pray, and you need to realize that you need to pray for us. Just as I, I preached on Wednesday, pray for me. As a pastor, pray for me. And I went through the various ways that you need to pray for me. But here's one of the reasons you need to pray for the leadership of our church. We don't have the right to make our plans for the church. The plans that God has for the church. Who, what is this that we're in? We're in a church building, but do you understand what a church is? It's the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is, this is not Don Staten's church. I've been here going on 34 years. This is not my church. This is not Danny Ford's church. It's not Dan Miller's church. It's not Darren Allen. Name anybody. It's nobody's church. It's God. It belongs to God, and it is God. It's his body. It's imperative to know. And we don't have a right to make the plans. I, have, I, I, don't, I don't have a right to have my plans being implemented. What are God's plans? And that's what should always be implemented. That same thing is true in our personal lives. And so these men undoubtedly are decent, respectable, even considerate people. They're religious. And in their daily lives, they live as if God doesn't exist. Now Listen. To live independently of God is to live as an atheist regardless of the beliefs that you may have about God. And you may even hold them dear. Now I want you to really stop and think. This can be life-changing for all of us. Just think back about the week's activities. Did you, even one, did you even one time bow your head and ask God's direction for you and what you were doing? Some of you, I know, are, are in places in your life where you're looking for relationships and new relationships. I, I don't mind saying this because this is not just true of you. It's true of anybody I see doing this. 
When I see people beginning to implement plans in their life, and particularly people that have been deeply wounded, they are especially vulnerable. And I look out and I say, you know, brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so is not here. This is the third Sunday that they've missed. You know what that tells me? You're making plans without God. And you need to understand that's a dead-end road. You know, one of the things that has always amazed me in failed relationships that people don't understand. Oftentimes, the very seed problem that was in the first relationship is carried into the second relationship. And the problems are just repeated over and over again. Listen, listen to me. And unless you get God, really get God in your life. I'm not talking about saying, I've been born again and I'm trusting the Lord. I'm talking about being faithful in church. I'm talking about getting into the Word of God. I'm talking about praying together. You're always vulnerable to Satan. He's always going to be trying to tear homes up. He delights in tearing homes up. And you're aiding him a great deal when you begin to do things your way and not in God's way. And that's, that brings us to the second point, James 4 and verse 14. Mistake number two. You're presuming to know the future. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It's just a vapor. You're here for a little while and then it vanishes away. You know, I alluded to at the beginning of this message, uh, noting the fascination that a lot of people have with psychics. Probably the, the most famous psychic that has lived in recent times has been Jean Dixon. I've said a lot about her from time to time in, in uh, messages gone by. In the late 1996, Dixon announced plans to join the 1-900 telephone network with her own Jean Dixon Psychic Network. She was going to tell you what was going to happen in the future. If you wanted to know, you call her up and you tell her who you are and she'll read your palm or she'll do some other thing and she'll tell you what's going to happen in the future. You know, it's an unfortunate thing, but she didn't even foresee her own imminent death. She never did get to use that network. She died January the 25th, 25th 1997. Apparently, unexpectedly, she couldn't even foresee her own death. L listen to me. Th those are phonies. People that are out there telling you to send your money in, get to the psychic network or, or, or some other thing, they're phonies. They may not even know they're phonies. It may very well be that Satan is the one implementing things in our because that's who it's coming from. God is the one who will give you everything you need to know. Just stay in his word and he'll give it to you. Then there's a purpose of life. He says, what is life? There's a failure to comprehend the purpose of life. Life is a chance, a lot of people think. Listen to me. Life is a gift. God gave you the gift of life, and life is an opportunity, and life makes all the difference in the world when you're giving it to God and letting God do what he wants to do. You know, you can have two individuals that are, this has always amazed me, have two individuals that have the same genetic background, they have the same things happen to them in life, and yet, while one has allowed those circumstances to crush them to the ground, the other has the same things that happen in their life, and they move forward and use those things to challenge them and build their life up. I'm saying that because I know some of you are deeply wounded and deeply hurt, and you've got to be careful. The last thing somebody who's deeply wounded and deeply hurt needs is somebody beating on them, somebody putting them down, somebody telling them bad things about them. You don't, you don't need that. You need built up. That's what you need. And you need built up by the eternal word of God. My entire point in this entire message is look to God because God has what you need, and God will give you what you need in your life, especially in these decisions that you're having to make. How we look at life makes all the difference in the world. There's a lot of people, and we've all been around people like this, that have attitude problems. I mean, they can't get along with anybody. You talk to them, and they're always on edge. they got you on edge. they get everybody else on edge, and you don't want to be around. But we can end up being people like that, too, and we don't even know we're like that. We don't even know that we're impacting people, but we do with our own attitudes. And so we've all been around adults like that. We've been around other people like that. And even though it's true that an attitude and a negative outlook on life is a failure to comprehend that life is a gift and life is an opportunity, sometimes it's a puzzle. We don't quite know what to do. Listen to what he says in Proverbs 27 and verse 1. I'm looking at the puzzle of life. There's a failure to comprehend the complexity of life. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Listen, we tend to forget that we're just finite human beings. That's all we are. We are people who are given to sin, people who are mess up all of the time. And God says, you need to turn to me. I am everything that you need, and I will help you in your life. 
There's a great example that we have in the Bible in Luke chapter 12, verses 16 through 21. I'm not going to read through that, but it's this type of thinking that is found in the parable of the rich young fool. He tells the rich man, Jesus tells the rich man that he was wealthy and that his barns were filled to overflowing. And here's what the rich man said to himself. Instead of looking at these as being the blessings of God, he said, I will pull down my barns and build greater barns and they will store up all the crops and my goods. And the Lord said this to him. You're such a good businessman, I'm so proud of you. You know what he said. The Lord said, in all of your planning, you've forgotten the most important thing. This day, today, your soul's going to be required of you. That is, you're going to die. You're going to stand before God. I, I say this all of the time. I do it for the shock value, if I can use it in that way, to bring people to an understanding. Somebody in this room is going to be the next to die. And it could be you. Come on, stay with me. Are you ready? Are you ready if you're going to stand before God? Are you? We tend to forget that there's just, we're just finite human beings. And then there's the pithiness of life. That simply is that there's a failure to comprehend the uncertainty and the brevity of life. The merchants not only have assumed that they know what will happen tomorrow, but they also assume that they would be alive tomorrow to enjoy those things. And underlying this whole attitude is the assumption that our lifespan is guaranteed. I have somebody that said this to me. Isn't there somewhere in the Bible that tells you? Yeah, there's Psalm chapter 90 and verse 10. Isn't there somewhere in the Bible that tells us that we're going to live 70 years? Well, stop and think. I mean, that's nonsense. The Bible says, well, let me just read it to you right here, if I can do it. Three score in 10 years. This is the kind of a life that many people will have. Common life that they'll have. It'll be that long. But there's a lot of people that live less than that. My dad died, I think, when he was 62 years old. My brother died when he was 59 years old. What happened to 70 years? That's no guarantee that you're going to live until you're 70 years old. You're going to live every day like this is the day that God's going to call me to stand before him, just as he said to this rich young fool. You know, the, the Bible uses a lot of interesting words about death. It says, life is a vapor. He says it's a puff of smoke, steam rising from hot water. It also speaks of, of life and death being breath, clouds, grass, a shadow, smoke. And because of all of that, when he says the uncertainty of what life is all about, he says in Psalm 90 and verse 12, So teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Life is short. We can't afford to spend our lives. We certainly don't want to waste our lives. We want to invest our lives for the honor and for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're almost done, so stay with me. There's something else that I want to bring to your attention found in James chapter 4 and verse 17. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. It's mistake number three. It's the delay of what should be done, procrastination. What's being described here is what we call the sin of omission. It's a sin of not only of doing something, not necessarily of doing something wrong, it's a sin of not doing something right that God wants us to do. Let me, let me give you, I've got one, two, three, four of these. Let me just give you a couple of examples of this. When you know someone needs a word of encouragement and you withhold it, I have uh, people in this church that are routinely do that for me, and I'm grateful for it. I hope that you have this too. When they see me, they'll say, you know, They'll look at me with this kind of tilted head and concern on my face. Are you okay today? And I want to say, do I not look okay today? But they do that, and they're saying it because they care about me. Do you have anybody in your life that does that? Well, you, you need to have someone. I preached a message this past Wednesday night, and the whole message was uh, praying for pastors, praying for me in particular. And I asked the church to pray for me in three different ways in particular that I had then. I could have had 30 different ways or 300 different ways, but... I asked him to pray for me, and you need to have somebody in your life that's that way too. Listen, the Bible says this. Withhold not good from them to whom it is due when it is in the power of thine hand to do it. When you know that you're wrong about something and yet you refuse to apologize for it. Sam, that was a great, great illustration that you gave. Nothing is better than personal illustrations. It takes a, it takes a committed Christian and a real man when you've offended someone, to go stand in front of them and say, I want to ask you to forgive me for what I just did. Have you ever done that in your life? Is there anybody that comes to your mind where you need to do that with? 
when you know someone needs forgiveness and you refuse to give it. I'm trusting the Holy Spirit of God to bring names and faces to your mind right now. There's somebody that you need to forgive and you withhold forgiveness from them. What about this? When you know someone who needs the truth and you don't give it to them. I'm talking about witnessing. I think that's one of them that comes to all of us. James says, when you know the right thing to do and you do not do it, it is sin. Knowledge of what's right and the ability to do it creates obligation to do it. Now we're almost finished. Here's the last thing. The right way to deal with the future. Ought to be obvious to you by now. James chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. For that you ought to say, if the Lord will... We shall live and do this or that. But now you rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. If it is God's will, it needs to be more than a statement from our lips. It needs to be the attitude of our hearts. A proper perspective. James is reminding us that our dependence should be on the Lord rather than a well-thought-out plan. That's the point of this. It's not that planning is bad. Don't walk out here with the wrong idea. There's nothing wrong with planning. There's something wrong when you plan without God. And then now the priority of the present. And this is maybe the most important thing I have to say in the entire message. We're almost done. The Bible has written the word now, N-O-W, in large letters throughout the gospel message. Listen to this in 1 Corinthians 6 2. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the great salvation. Here's the bottom line this is the greatest presumption of all that God's going to let you live long enough, another day, another chance to receive Christ as Savior. He says, if he has spoken to you right now in this service today, and you know your loss, I share it with you, it's no accident that you're here today. God brought you here. He wants you here. He wanted you to hear these things that are being said. I'm the mouthpiece. It's God that's doing the speaking to you. Whatever frailties I may have, whatever difficulties I may have in being able to deliver the message, that's not the point. The point is that God speaks, and God is speaking to you today, and you're the only one that can acknowledge that. You need to, first of all, in this invitation, acknowledge that God is speaking to me in this service. And he's saying to you, I gave my son to die on the cross of Calvary for your sin, and I'm offering to you eternal life. What kind of a fool would it be that would not accept eternal life? And all you've got to do is this. It's very simple. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That means believe that he died on the cross for you personally, for your sins. And then after you believe upon him, believe that God raised him from the dead. Because he's alive today. In fact, he's the one who's here speaking today. And then you simply say, Lord, here's my life. I'm not doing such a good job with it. I give it to you for your honor and glory. And if you'll do that, you'll walk out of here today with eternal life. Let's stand together with every head bowed and every eye closed.